What a great day of worship that we are in. We uh, have been talking about the I am statements, the seven statements of Jesus, looking at what that really means, and it boils down to the identity of Christ, and as we take Christ into our life, we then become and have that identity. One of the great opportunities, yet very challenging responsibilities that I have is to visit and talk with individuals and with couples. And one of the things that I always do with individuals is I want them to understand the importance of their identity. Now, let me just tell you, identity is something that you do not have because of what other people think of you. That's, that's the perception that you have that deals with confidence. Identity is this understanding of who you really believe that you are, regardless of what you go through, regardless of what other people think of you. And one of the things I also talk with couples is as a couple, what is your identity as a couple? Because when two become one flesh, as God's word tells us in Genesis, it's the idea of understanding what that new identity in God can be for the two of you. That's an amazing thing to be able to talk about. So when Jesus begins to give us clues of his identity, of who he is, the I am statements, what does that really mean for us? Last week we talked about in John chapter 8 verse 12 the understanding of Jesus is the light. And in the context of the festival that they were experiencing, how they built these huge candelabras and torches that lit up the temple. And then Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. Today we're going to look at John chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, turn with me as we look in there. Open your Bibles, open your app, follow along. I'm going to read the first 16 verses of John chapter 10. And Jesus says this, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have, list, have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not in this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The amazing thing about this text that gives us an understanding of the identity of Jesus as he makes these claims upon who he is and what he does is Jesus was, ref- was responding to the Pharisees. Now again, the Pharisees were those people that were over the temple. Now let's, let me just remind you the importance of this. The temple is where God's presence was. So every time that the people would come to the temple... Every time they would come and sacrifice, every time they would follow the law that was passed down through the Old Testament, they would come to the temple because that's where God's presence was. That's where the Holy of Holies is that held the Ark of the Covenant. This is where people wanted to be. The Pharisees were those who helped govern over the temple. 
So if they had the authority, they had the authority to cast you out of the temple, which meant you were not able to go to the presence of God and present the offerings and the sacrifices that you were commanded to do. So these Pharisees are the ones that Jesus is responding to. And the amazing thing about it is it's because Jesus healed a blind man on a Sabbath. And that was against the rules. I know none of us here deal with breaking the rules. So we may not know what Jesus is going through. But Jesus performed a miracle. And the Pharisees were questioning. In fact, chapter 9, we'll look at a little bit in a second. But in chapter 9 is the story of Jesus healing the blind man and how the Pharisees were questioning this man. And so Jesus responds to the Pharisees. And he says these words that claim his identity. You see, the amazing thing about it is when Jesus makes these claims of who he is and his identity, some of us in today's culture may not realize the authority of Jesus. We may not recognize the authority of Jesus. In fact, some people would say, isn't Jesus being a little selfish, saying all these things about himself? Isn't there other ways to be able to experience happiness? In fact, let me just say this. What other religion in the history of mankind actually has a plan where the major prophet or teacher or savior or redeemer comes knowing that they are going to give their life and die for other people? You're not going to find it anywhere else. They'll come and they'll teach you about the law that you're supposed to do. They may even die and claim to be a martyr. But the plan is never to die. Only through Jesus. Now the amazing thing about this also is that when we read this story, Jesus gives us this picture of sheep and a shepherd in a pen and a gate. But this story has nothing to do with the sheep. You think, well, oh my gosh. It's all about, it's what, these are red letters. That means it's important. But this passage is not about the sheep. This passage is about the identity and truth of who Jesus is. In the midst of conflict, in the midst of trials, in the midst of persecution. This story is all about the identity of who Jesus is. And the amazing thing about it is, church, when we take on Jesus in our life, we have that identity in our life. And that's the amazing thing about it. So let's look at the claim that Jesus makes so that we can understand what he is saying in this statement in his claim. Two things that I want to share with you. The first one is the truth of what Jesus tells us. The truth is that everything in this story points to Jesus himself. When he's talking about this with the Pharisees, telling them about this story, explaining this, everything points to Jesus The truth is that Jesus contrasts who he is and who the Pharisees believe to be. He contrasts with the truth of who he is with the deception and the deceivers that are out there. And then in the same way, you and I must come to a point in our life where we must choose the truth. Are we really going to believe what Jesus says about himself or are we going to believe everybody else? Because there are many happy ways, many ways that you can become happy. There's only one way that will save you. There are many ways where we may become comfortable. There's many things that we can acquire in our life. But there's only one way that will give us an eternal life. And that is through Jesus. So the truth is, when Jesus points to himself and he gives these examples in verse 1, he says, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs any other way is a thief and a robber. These are the people who have the identity of deception. He goes on in verse 5 and he says, They will never follow a stranger. In fact, they run away from him because they do not recognize the voice. In verse 10 through 7 through 10, Jesus says again, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. Jesus is contrasting the truth of who he is based upon what these Pharisees understand about the Messiah. They did not believe Jesus is who he is. But what we're given here in the claim of Jesus is his truth. That is, he is the only way, the one gate, the one door that will lead to salvation that will lead to protection, that will lead to comfort in our lives only through Jesus. Nothing else will give us this. 
anything else that we try to put into our lives and say, oh, I'm just going to go to church every time the door is open. Listen, folks, that's not what's going to save you. Oh, I'm going to tithe and be faithful in everything. In fact, I'll maybe even give a little more than my tithe. Hallelujah. That would be good, let me tell you. If you feel free to do that, do that. But that's not going to save you. We can serve in every opportunity that we have. In fact, we could even be called a servant of God. But that's not going to save you. Only through Jesus. Jesus is proclaiming the truth of his identity. Who he is. That he was the true Messiah that was going to come. The Pharisees didn't see this. The second thing that I want to share with you is that the character of Jesus is also given to us as a part of his identity. Jesus was the only one to lay down his life, as he talked about in verse 11, as being the good shepherd. You see, unlike the hired hand, Jesus was the one who knew the sheep, sheep owned the sheep. The sheep listened to his voice. He mentioned the hired hand because the hired hand only was there to do a job. He did not own the sheep. And a lot of times the truth of the character of a person will come out when trials come. So when the wolf come, what does the man do? The hired hand runs. So again, remember that Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees about something that had happened and they were questioning who he is. So Jesus comes back with claims of identity of who he is. That I am the only way, the truth, the salvation. Because of who he is. And because of his character, all that does is just reiterate the truth of his identity. The fact that Jesus says, I am the one who's going to lay down my life. And he tells us not to be deceived. And in fact, in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, it says this, Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. In Acts 2.21, it also says this, And everyone who calls... On the name of the Lord will be saved. No other way. This is why Jesus says, be very careful. Anybody who comes in any other way, over the fence, under the fence, through the fence, is not the right one to follow. Only the one who comes by the gate, and I am the gate. And don't be deceived to think that some people are going to be there for you whenever the hard times come. And Jesus says, listen. In fact, it even says in verse 6, they didn't understand, so Jesus explained it a little closer. And that's when he says, I'm the gate. I am the gate. When he says, I'm the good shepherd, I lay down my life, and no one else does this. But you see, what we understand about this is that the Pharisees were blind to the understanding of who Jesus is. They were blind because they did not choose to accept the authority of Jesus and who he is as the promised Messiah, as the Savior for, for all the sinners, as the redeemer of life to give us. In 1 John 5, 11 and 12, it says this, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Jesus laid down his life for us so that we may be restored in the relationship. You see, that's the amazing thing about it. When we look at the identity of who Jesus is, when we look at the truth of who he says he is in the midst of the conflict that's going on, when he says that I am the good shepherd and I'm going to lay down my life for my sheep, he's talking about every single one of us when he lays down his life. He sacrifices. Why? Because he knows the sheep. Whereas anybody else, it's just a deception. You hire someone thinking that they're going to protect the sheep? No, but when the wolf comes, they're gone. And this goes back to the character of who Jesus is. And I want us to understand that as Jesus is proclaiming who he is in the midst of the conflict with the Pharisees, he's also telling each and every one of us, listen, be very careful. Know me for who I am. See me for what I do. And that's the amazing thing that we can come about Jesus. His character is a selfless sacrifice. His character in this particular story about being the good shepherd is one to tell us that we can have comfort in knowing that Jesus will never leave us. That's why it's important for us to understand what God has done. That's why it's important for us to sing these songs of worship to remind us that Jesus is the only one to salvation and he has done this because he gave of himself. 
he sacrificed on the cross for our sin. And if we claim to have Jesus, then we have this identity within us. So what makes these claims so important? Let's look back at what Jesus responded to. Because in John chapter 9 is the story about Jesus responding to the Pharisees who were questioning this man. You see, the whole problem is because Jesus healed a man that was born blind on the Sabbath. Now, that got the Pharisees riled up. You know, it was kind of stirring the pot. And so why is it so important that, they, that Jesus responds in such a way? It's because the Pharisees, who were supposed to know the truth, didn't accept the truth because they didn't see who Jesus really was. So what they did is they called this man in. Now, now get this, church. The man who was blind and they knew was blind is now standing before them looking at them. And they say, how can this be? What happened? And the man says, this guy came up, put mud on my eyes, said a few words, and behold, I wash it out and I can see. And they say, well, who is he? And he says, a prophet. Because the man really didn't know who Jesus was. And so the Pharisees don't buy that, so they call the parents in and they say, parents, is this the person? Is this your son? Yes, well, who healed him? How did it happen? They say, we can't tell you anything of that because he's old enough to know because the parents were scared they were going to be kicked out of the temple as well. And so they said, listen, we know he was born blind because we were there. <laughs> but now apparently he can see. So I don't know what's going on, but something major is going on. And so the Pharisees say, okay. And so they begin to question the guy again. And if we get a little later in chapter 9... They hurl insults at him and say, how can you, you know, say all these kind of things? Who is this person? And they don't know. And finally, it comes to the point in verse 34 where they say this, you are steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So the Pharisees got mad enough at this man who now sees because something miraculous would happen and they didn't buy the story that he gave him. And so they kick him out of the temple. So get this. Here's where it gets good. In verse 35 of chapter 9, Jesus goes and finds the man. It's not like, oh, let me just send him a text and we can meet up and, and you know, have dinner together. No, it's that he went and looked for the man because he knew that he had been cast out because of what Jesus had done in his life. And in my mind, I'm thinking, Jesus knows what's going on. <laughs> J Jesus sees everything. And he knows. And this is just one of those great opportunities where Jesus can peel away some of the layers or peel away the blind spots in people's eyes so that they may see who he really is. Because that's the identity of Jesus. And so Jesus says to him in verse 35, Do you believe in the Son of Man? When he finds the blind guy, and he says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man says in verse 36, Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. And get this. I love this. Jesus said, you now have seen him. The guy was blind and healed. And Jesus comes and says, listen, do you believe in the son of God? And he says, well, I don't know. Who is he? And Jesus says, you're looking at him. Can you imagine the guy? I would have been flipping out. And the amazing thing about it is here is Jesus revealing his character and his identity to this man who had no clue what happened. He just knew that he could see. And then when he says this in verse 37, he says, and now you see him. In fact, he's the one speaking to you. And the man says in 38, then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. The amazing thing about it is Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. And, and boy, this made the Pharisees mad. Because you see, they were listening. And, and when they heard this, they're like, Jesus, are we blind? And he says in verse 41, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Now, that's a funny way of Jesus saying the point, uh, yeah, you're blind. You are blind. Because the Pharisees could not see the identity of Jesus or accept what he was doing. 
And this is why Jesus says, listen, Pharisees, there's only one way. There's a gate, and I am the gate. There are sheep, and I am the shepherd that will lay down my life for the sheep. You see, this doesn't have much to do with the sheep. This has everything to do with the identity of who Jesus is. The fact that he said, I am the good shepherd. This selfless character of sacrifice that Jesus was going to make, not only for those that were going to listen, for those that were going to see, but also for those that he was yet to reach. Look at verse 16. I have other sheep that are not in this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Church, let me ask you this. There's something you're going through today that may cause you to be blind. You may forget about how great God am, how great God is. And when we sing that song, The Great I Am, that just reminds me of the amazing thing that God did for me. That in spite of all my failures and my sin and my constant struggle to be holy, God said, you're valuable enough that I will lay down my life. That is the good shepherd. And, and, and when I come to the point and I hear all these things going on and world is just falling to pieces and things aren't going right and this is not the life that I wanted, I hope for so much more. And yet when I listen to those things, I become blinded of what God has done for me, that he is the one that I can count on, the one to direct my steps, the one that will guide me. He is the gate that I must go through. And we must give ourselves to him that we may experience what it's like to be in that one flock and one shepherd. What about you today? Are you in that place in your life where you just don't know where to turn? Then understand the identity of who Jesus is. Understand that he is all that he claims to be. Because his character and what he did explains every bit of that. And all you and I have to do is remember and see who Jesus really is. Don't be blind. Let's pray.